Inside the stories that affect you. This is Inside Kelloland. I'm Angela Kennecke. Thanks for joining us. Coming up on this week's Inside Kelloland, it has been 100 years since South Dakota ratified the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. We show you how women in South Dakota are honoring a century of voting. Plus, it's a resource many parents may not know about. We show you the programs and services available through the South Dakota School for the Deaf. And it's a big anniversary for Kelloland as we look back on 60 years of broadcasting from inside this building in downtown Sioux Falls. We'll take you down a trip on memory lane. Well, joining us now is Karen Gubrud, Jennifer Berger, and Paula Van Sherrill with the South Dakota Federation of Republican Women. Thank you so much for being with us today. Last weekend, your group was able to march in Pierre. Tell me a little bit about that, what the event was. Well, we were having a board of directors meeting, and we were in the state capitol anyway, and we thought this is a perfect time to kick off acknowledging our 100 years. So we dressed up and made hats and had hat sashes and, and um, yeah, marched. Yeah, we see you. Kind we marched. Fun. And each time we went past the camera, we would have a different slogan, like 100 years of voting or women's voting or suffrage or something. It was just a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of women went through all kinds of things. 51 years women in South Dakota worked before they got this 19th Amendment passed. For 51 years. For 51 years. When they first, we were still a territory, the first territorial legislation put it on there, but it didn't go through. I think a lot of young women just take for granted that they I can they vote. Do. I took a class in college where I studied suffrage and Susan B. Anthony and all these historical figures, and it was fascinating for me. But what would you like young women to know? about women gaining the right to vote? Well, it paved the way for women like our governor, Christy Noem. It's so fantastic to finally have a woman governor. And, you know, it took 100 years to get that accomplished after we got the vote. But it's important for all the young girls and young women today to realize that that's an achievable goal. I think when we saw our last election in um, 2016 and a woman was running for president, no matter what your political views are, there were a lot of women that were encouraged to see a woman running for president. Do you believe a woman will be president in our lifetime? I do. I fully believe there will be a woman president in our lifetime. Um, there are some outstanding women out there. Uh, right now you've got how many women in cabinet positions? You have women at the United Nations. You've got women doing all kinds of things. I think we'll have a woman president. I really do. And I think it's important for young women to realize what some women prior to us went through to get to that. First, they had the right to even vote on little um, issues at a school board meeting. They couldn't vote on any, any big things, like the small things. And then they got to vote for the school board, but just the trustees and not the superintendents or the people. And then they got to vote in local elections. And step by step, they worked their way. And people came from, lots of East Coast people, people came from all over the country. To, to help South Dakota got a lot of attention. What was interesting is Susan B. Anthony was here in the state mm -hmm. for a while. She mm -hmm. spent months here working for this project. Yeah, she was back twice. She was back twice. Lots of people came from the East Coast. Uh, the East Coast had organizations that were sending money and sponsoring us. Many from New York and Pennsylvania sent all kinds of people in all kinds of things. Um, in uh, 1910, the, the 1910 election, we actually had a men's suffrage group that was formed in Sioux Falls in Lincoln County hmm. that helped women get the right to vote. Yeah. Uh, they worked really hard. There were women who came and suffered our, from the East Coast, came, suffered our South Dakota winters and weather. Three of them died for this. Well, uh, I've never heard that part of history. Yes, so three, that's three women that came. Group is one, got, that alive. one got typhoid and one got, died from pneumonia and, and one just, Susan B. Anthony, got very, very sick. She didn't die, but somebody else did. There were three of them that died trying to help us. So in addition to keeping history alive and keeping this in people's memories, you know so much about it, what else is your group doing? We're going to be in all the, the 4th of July parades and local festivals and things like that uh, as they come along in floats or cars or marching, just for fun, just to, keep the, to make this very aware. And each club or each county is going to do some kind of a special event uh, the yet to be decided because we just started this process. But we but also do a lot to fund women candidates and support them. Mm -hmm. But we also support the men too. Uh, Republican women are very instrumental in getting 
people elected to office. What do you see for the future of our state with Republican women? I think the Republican women movement is going to grow. Uh, there's more interest. I think a lot of the interest in politics in general was fired up by President Trump's election, the, the campaign and all of it. And this energy is staying alive. And more women are seeing that he is, like I say, putting people in secretary, in, in secretary this or that, cabinet positions, and women can go a long ways. I think women in South Dakota can do the same thing. We've got 22% of our legislators are women in South Dakota. It has grown a little bit mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the number of legislators. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it will continue to grow. What about your membership? Are you looking for more members? Oh, to always. Your always. <laughs> and why should they join? Why should they join? There are so many benefits. We are part of a, a very large organization. When you join a local club, you become a member of the South Dakota Federation of Republican Women and a, part, and a member of the National Federation of Republican Women. So we have offices right in Washington. So we have lobbying and we've got 50, women are 52% of the voting bloc. And we have uh, candidate training mm -hmm. also. When you say candidate training, tell me what you mean by that. <clears throat> I ran for state legislative mm -hmm. um, for the South Dakota House back in 2004, and they, the Republicans have campaign training schools that you can go to to help you with your campaign and also to help other people with their campaigns. Right, well, especially at the local level, people don't really, I mean, they aren't experienced politicians typically. It's not like they're going, a career politician or anything like right. that, so I'm sure they do need some help. Right. And we do lots of door knocking and... To and get people to vote? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in the, the local, the, the, Sioux, the one here in Sioux Falls, the club here in Sioux Falls, there are eight notaries. So we do a lot of absentee ballots and helping people register who can't get out and about. I spent three days driving around doing that in the well, last Well, good for one. you. Thanks for doing that. Well, thank <laughs> you so much all for being here. Well, thank you. Well, coming up after the break, we're talking with the South Dakota School for the Deaf and what services it offers to all families right after this. Welcome back to Inside Kello Land. The main campus for the South Dakota School for the Deaf has changed, but still offers many services and programs to families all across the state. Joining us now are Greg King, an audiologist with SDSU, Kim Wadsworth, Director of Outreach, and Hope Bader, whose child uses School for the Deaf services. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Kim, maybe we could start off talking a little bit about those changes to the School for the Deaf. At one point, it was a residential school. Um, right. Uh, it's been a residential school for a, a long time, but then in 2000, early 2000, um, the residential program kind of went away. We got down to about two kids and it was not cost effective. And um, then in 2009, um, the school shifted to all outreach. We don't have kids come on campus every day for classes. You go to the schools? So right now, yes, we're an all outreach program. So we have services across the state. So we have um, 11 outreach consultants um, around the state, six here in Sioux Falls at the building on 10th Street, um, one in Pier, one in Aberdeen, and then three out west in the Rapid City, Hot Springs, Deadwood area. And Greg, you're here as an audio, audio, audiologist. I can get that out. Um, tell me a little bit about what you do. Well, uh, what we do is we provide audiological services for all the children in the state of South Dakota, birth to 21, unless they have a signed high school diploma and those services are free of charge. Uh, we currently have a clinic at the South Dakota School for the Deaf here in Sioux Falls. We have an audiologist stationed there. We have an audiologist and an audiology technician stationed in uh, Rapid City where we have a clinic also and they provide services to kind of the western part of the state. Uh, we also have a mobile hearing lab that we take out and we serve all areas of the state uh, and we take that mobile lab into some of the rural areas and uh, so those services are available to all the kids in South Dakota. And Hope is here and I've known Hope for 18 years. Yes. Uh, I did the original story on your daughter Emma who yes. was born the smallest baby ever to survive at Sanford Children's. She is about the size of a Coke can. We have a picture here. Um, I don't know if, yeah there we go. Um, see how small Emma was. And that was <laughs> this is her diaper, actually, that she had. So um, that's how tiny she was. And I'll never forget, 
I'll never forget it, that story. And I've done a lot of stories over my career. But also, I've watched uh, Emma grow. And she is an amazing young woman. She's a talented musician. Uh, she is so sociable and so personable. And she's dealt with um, having a hearing loss and cochlear implants for her, her entire life. Yep, she's had hearing aids since she was six months old. We found out when she was about four months old that she was profoundly deaf. That's typical with somebody who's born this young. It is. It, it was a combination. We're fairly certain that she was born hearing, but between her prematurity, she was born at 25 weeks, being so small and having to be on the vent, and then we had to give her a, a genomycin, an autotoxic medication, because we thought she had pneumonia. So the combination of those three things we're fairly certain is what caused the deafness. Now, when I talked to Emma today, you would never know, no. you know that she had any hearing loss because she reads lips and she speaks just like just like any other high school kid who's going to graduate, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, tell me a little bit about how, over these years, you've utilized these services. Definitely. So when we found out when she, that she was deaf after our hearing test, of course, you, you just don't know what's going to happen. You've never been around anyone that's deaf. Now you're just finding out that your four-month-old baby is deaf and you don't know what her life is going to look like. So fortunately at that point, Birth to Three Services gets you connected with School for the Deaf. And so Kim actually was our outreach consultant at that time. So she would come to our house every week and teach us sign language and just get us more knowledge regarding deaf culture, sign language, and things to anticipate for Emma going forward. Is there anything you feel within these services that you're just so happy that you had, that you're really happy that Emma was able to get that, or her life maybe wouldn't have been as, as productive as it has been? Oh, definitely. Between just the outreach just for her, us as her family, learning sign language, teaching Emma sign language that young, and just going down the road, uh, Emma has always had interpreters at school ever since she was in preschool. So there was always that support that if we ran into obstacles, with classes, with what she needed accommodations for. Anything that she would need due to her deafness, we can go to School for the Deaf and have someone come with us to advocate for what Emma would need. And even now at this point in Emma's life, she attends a teen group. So she's with other teenagers that are deaf that she doesn't have access to maybe during the day, during the school day. Because it's easy to feel different or isolated Definitely. when you feel different. Yeah, think of that, you know, she's an 18 year old or through her whole school life, she's always had an adult walking next to her her whole time because she's always had an interpreter. So that can be intimidating for other students that, you know, don't know how, if they're comfortable coming up to her to talk to her. And then she also participates in the deaf dine-in where um, just the deaf community goes and dines at different restaurants once a month or I think every so often. And she'll go and just have interactions with other deaf adults too. That is fantastic. Well, we are going to continue our conversation about the South Dakota School for the Deaf when we return. Welcome back to Inside Kettle, and we are continuing our discussion about the South Dakota School for the Deaf, and joining us now are Kim Wadsworth, Director of Outreach, and Kemi Van Sickle, the Service Coordinator, and Julie Luke, an Outreach Consultant, and we have an interpreter here, Hannah. So thank you very much for all being here, and welcome back to the segment, Kim. Um, thank you. First, let's talk about how students are directed to the School for the Deaf. Yes, the School for the Deaf um, works with any child with any identified uh, hearing loss of any, any kind. Um, we work with unilateral losses to profound losses. So we get referrals from our mobile lab. We get referrals from birth to three, from audiologists, from hospitals, from school districts. So they come over. As soon as they get the name of a child, um, then it goes right out to the consultant in that area. So within 48 hours, within two days really, we want the consultant to touch base with that parent to say hi. Introduce themselves and let them know that they're here to support them in their journey with this, um, having if they have a baby who is deaf or hard of hearing. Our mission statement is that we are partners in educational success. And so we really try to, to live by that and we have wonderfully committed consultants that are just passionate about what they do. And Cami, it's your job to evaluate the students and how they're doing. Yes, I'm the service coordinator at the School for the Deaf and I set up times, five times a year where deaf and hard of hearing kids can come to campus either at the campus in Sioux Falls or the campus in Rapid City and we do a full evaluation on all the kiddos. Um, we usually hit about 25 kids a year and we will um, evaluate different areas like ac academics, ASL, um, transition, cognitive abilities, um, emotional behavioral, and audiology. So we'll, we'll evaluate the kiddos and then we'll, we'll 
develop a report and then we'll meet with the team and we'll kind of, we'll give them our recommendations. And Julie, you're working on something for the summer. Yes, we're very excited. Every year in the summer, we have a program called Hands in, in Motion, and um, all the deaf, hard of hearing kids across the state of South Dakota are invited, ages two to fifth grade, and it's really important for these kids to get together because they're all alone in their own school district. So just like what Hope mentioned about her daughter feeling isolated, so this is an opportunity for all of the students to get together at SDSD for the month of July. So we're thrilled to have it every year, and we try to connect them with deaf, hard of hearing, Walmart, Model. We go on field trip. We do fun language activities. Just the it's just a lot fun of fun. things that kids a lot should of do. Fun. Yeah, right. But they get mm -hmm. to do it with others who are just like them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know we have an SDSD foundation who has been very supportive of uh, all of our activities and stuff and such. They help provide funding for um, social and educational activities for families and kids, for scholarships, for camps, and Great. for technology. Fantastic. Well, we've put a lot more information for you online on Inside Kelloland, and we'll be right back with a look at our 60-year anniversary of the Kelloland Building. Welcome back. Earlier this week, Kello TV celebrated 60 years of broadcasting from this building at the corner of 13th and Phillips. From the groundbreaking to the construction to the dedication, it was a big deal back in 1959. Kello Band's Don Jorgensen takes a look back at 60 years of memorable moments. In the spring of 1958, crews broke ground on what would later become the new Kello TV and Radio Broadcast Center. Here's a picture of owner Joe Floyd turning a ceremonial shovel of dirt. His father, A.M. Floyd, was called out of retirement to be the consulting contractor for the construction. From pouring concrete to block work to electrical wiring, it was a massive undertaking to construct the 30,000 square foot building designed specifically for broadcasting that became the foundation to a lasting legacy. This building held both television and radio at the time it was built. And it was, at the time, modern and had a lot of technological advances that you know, we don't really think of today. After a year of construction, Kello TV officially went on the air from its new building on May 9th, 1959. It was such a huge accomplishment for South Dakota that it captured the attention of a lot of political leaders, including Vice President Richard Nixon. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to extend greetings and best wishes to station KELO on the occasion of the dedication of its new facilities in Sioux Falls. And also at the same time to extend my best wishes to all of the listeners in what I understand is termed as Kelloland. There were 121 employees engaged in a wide variety of tasks involved in the complex operation of 18 hours of television and 20 hours of radio programming every day, 365 days a year. Back then, commercials were live in the studio. I would speed in excess of 70 miles an hour. We still have a garage door in the back that they could bring in cars when they did live commercials and showed cars. So all of those doors were built at the time to bring in large, larger vehicles. And so you look at them now, and yes, they're useful, but that's what they were really for. But I think, I think the most amazing thing to me is that the studio itself, while it's gone through many renovations, including high definition, it's been the studio for 60 years. That's where the news has been broadcast in Sioux Falls for Kelloland TV for 60 years. Except on a few occasions. At the height of the farm crisis of the mid-1980s, former anchor Doug Lott remembers when the news team was basically kicked out of our studio. Good evening, it's a first. The nation's television sets were turned to Sioux Falls, South Dakota tonight as Dan Rather kicked off the first of three broadcasts of the CBS Evening News that are originating from the Kelloland studios. We visited with Doug in his basement where he has a lot of Kello memorabilia hanging on his walls. He says Dan Rather and the CBS News crew came to Sioux Falls to broadcast its news and transformed our studio into their own. Good evening, this is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting tonight from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. As a consequence, we got to see the whole CBS Evening News uh, done right there in our studio. In the meantime, we had to move across the street in the brand new Kello Radio building, so we were down in the basement over there. And that's where Charles Carroll joined them on set for a brief interview. 
there's a lot of memories, certainly a lot of memories over the f almost 40 years I've walked in. One of Huizinga's fondest memories was the Captain Eleven show broadcast daily in the same studio. I'll ask you, Carmelita, how's my crew today? <laughs> I was a child and I came here to see Captain Eleven, you know, in the, in the, in the studio now that I walk in and see the Kelloland News folks and I see Kelloland Living and all the other shows that we do there. You know, that's where Captain Eleven was, too, and we know exactly where Captain Eleven, we set up his studio. We knew where the kids sat. We put the chairs out. I mean, it was all part of the process, and that studio has seen a lot in its 60-year history. While there have been updates and renovations to the building, mostly on the inside, the outside of the structure has pretty much retained its same look over the 60 years. I thought the building has always served us well, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's changed with the times and modernized. It's a staple there, and I love the fact that we have the tower right out the back door, and the, the fact that Joe Floyd, who started the whole darn thing, uh, when the tower lights became pretty expensive to replace every Christmas, you know, he says, no, I don't care what it costs, those blankety-blank lights are going up every blankety blank Christmas or before until I die. But it was, it was, that was him, you know. It would be nice to have a more modern facility, but this place has great bones and there's a lot of tradition here. Every time that subject has come up, we've kind of decided we have, we know what we have here. Uh, we, we, ha we know where everything is. It would be nice to, but Remember, in, in the current age that we're in, that electronics and that type of thing are getting more condensed, not growing. So when you're able to, instead of drive a truck, but carry a backpack to a news conference or to a story, those, it does, you don't need more room, you really need less room. And the reason television stations build new buildings is because they need less room. I've been walking into this studio now for almost 30 years, and this is my take on the building. Yes, it's old, but so is Lambeau Field and Fenway Park, and those stadiums are iconic. But it's not the design of the structures that made them iconic. It was the players who came to work every day, striving to do their best, doing miraculous and memorable achievements that only legends are made of. For 60 years, Kellow has provided professional and quality work unmatched in this area. These are our players. And this is our stadium. Getting a little sentimental about this building. Well, that is all the time we have for this week's Inside Cumberland. Oh, by the way, there's a whole photo gallery on that story as well. For more on today's topics, just head to Cumberland.com. Good night.